vem. Uh, yes, you said that. Well, yeah. Xbox, what's your game? Fortnite. Fortnite. I know that one too. What do you got? Bunny. You don't have any toys? <laughs> I'm not a girl and I'm not four. I don't know. I don't know. your toys. You got your favorite toys that you're playing with. That's cool. Those toys up. No. No? no. <laughs> that was a pretty affirmative. No, I'm not going to give that up. Not for anything? Not for anything? What if I gave you 20 bucks? If I gave you 20 bucks, would you give me all your Barbies? No. 50 bucks? If I gave you 50 bucks, would you give me your Xbox? No. $100. No. Two packages of double stuffed Oreos. No. Oh, I thought that one might work. Yeah, you, you think about how much you love. Now, think about not so much your toys, but like what about your parents? How much you love your parents, right? You wouldn't give your parents up for anything, would you? No. Not even two packages of double stuffed Oreos? No, not even for those. No, we wouldn't do that. We wouldn't give our parents up for anything because we love them. And our parents, same thing. They feel the same way about us. They love us. They wouldn't give you up for anything, nothing whatsoever. That's how God felt, God the Father felt about his son Jesus. He loved Jesus more than anything. And yet, what was God willing to do with Jesus in order that we would be saved? What was he willing to do? Yeah, He was willing to sacrifice his only son, his only begotten son. He was willing to, so that way he could have Kinsley and Brantley and Sam and all of us here. He was willing to do that because he loves you so much. And that's what we, we just marvel and we are in, in awe of today at how much our God is willing to give up and how much our God is willing to love us. Let's thank him for doing that, okay? Let's fold our hands and pray. Dear Jesus, thank you for giving yourself up for us on the cross, dear God, our Heavenly Father, thank you for being willing to give up your Son that we might be yours. Help us to ponder that and treasure that each and every day. Thank you. Amen. All right. Nice job. You guys can go sit back down with mom and dad or whoever brought you here today. Uh, we need child care. John and Laura are in the back, uh, like second grade down so they're not over by little ones. Uh, if you do have small children and you need to make use of the ministry center, the service is piped into there, uh, so you can do that as well. We will uh, continue our service then with the singing of our hymn of the day, The Lamb. We are going to sing just stanzas one, two, and four. So one, two, and four of The Lamb.
that makes me his own. The Lamb is reigning on his throne. God's grace, his mercy, and peace are yours in abundance. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, our King. Amen. The word for our consideration here this morning is taken from Genesis chapter 22. I'm going to read a few of those verses again. The angel of the Lord called to Abraham a second time and said, I swear by myself, declares the Lord, that because you have done this and have not withheld your son, your only son, I will surely bless you and make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and as the sand on the seashore. Your descendants will take possession of the cities of their enemies, and through your offspring, all nations on earth will be blessed because you have obeyed me. This is the word of our God. Please bow your heads and join me in prayer. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. And your friends in Christ, there is nothing really quite like it. The feeling is, I don't know if indescribable is an overstatement, but try. How did you feel the first time you held your child? How'd you feel? What did you just whisper to her? With Tired? With my hands. What? I don't. No, Mike said, with my hands. Yeah. How did you feel? With my hands. Yes. But, um, shh. Do you get it? See what he's saying there? You see? Yeah, okay. He gets, Landon gets it. What do you think? What, what did you feel? Lucky. Joy. Lucky? Wonderful. Wonderful. Awe. Joy. Joy. Yeah. Overwhelmed. Whoa, things just got real, right? <laughs> Where all of a sudden reality sank in. This is what's going to happen next, what I'm supposed to do. I mean, it is a kind of an indescribable feeling. I mean, there's this elation. It's kind of surreal. It, it, it's in that moment that, you know, we're wired this way where natural instinct says, I got to do everything I can to take care of this child. There isn't anything that I wouldn't give up, not even a box of double stuffed Oreos that I wouldn't give up. Eh, Chris, eh, maybe. Anything for this child. I'd do whatever it takes, right? If I have to skip a meal, if I have to skip some free thing if I, or some fun thing, I have to give that up for that child. I'd be willing to do that. I'd be willing to sacrifice. I'd be willing to do whatever it takes for this baby because here I have this tender and helpless little bundle of joy that God has blessed me with, this gift that God has given, and I would do anything for that child, do anything for that baby. I'm, I'm sure that Abraham felt the exact same way, although he had to wait a little longer than most to enjoy fatherhood. Uh, a long time ago, God had come to Abraham and told him that he was going to be a father. And not only that, but this child carried for the world several implications. He had assured Abraham at the age of 75, age of 75, I will make you into a great nation and I will bless you. I will make your name great and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and whoever curses you, I will curse and all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. God later then renewed these promises and assured Abraham, look up at the heavens and count the stars if indeed you can count them. So shall your offspring be. But then God made Abraham wait 25 years. 25 years after being told and assured by God these promises, he waited and waited and waited some more. And finally, the day came. At the age of 100, Sarah gave birth. And wow, baby boy, here we go. My line is 
continued in the fulfillment in that child. All these promises. Here's the first step God has taken in, in order to make my family line huge in order to build a great nation out of me through this child, in order to bless the world through this child. Oh, the elation, the joy, I would do anything. God came through on this promise and there isn't anything I wouldn't do to protect this child, to keep this child safe so those promises of God can be fulfilled. But then a few years later, again, we're not told exactly when, but Isaac is now a young child. Maybe he was six, maybe he was 16. I, I, I don't know. God comes to Abraham again. This time he says this. God said, take your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac, and go to the region of Moriah. Sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on a mountain I will show you. Jarring would be an understatement. Can you imagine the, the pit in Abraham's stomach, the lump in his throat? Can you imagine the mental gymnastics his heart, his faith, his brain would have been trying to do? But, but wait a minute, God. You, you said you were going to build up my family line through this child. You said you were going to turn us into a great nation through this child. You said the world was going to be blessed through this child. How, how can I sacrifice him? I would sacrifice anything for this child, but not, not sacrifice my child himself. God, I can't. how could you ask me to do that? This is my flesh. This is my blood. How, how could you ask me to give him up? I mean, I'm not some barbarian. I, who would do such a thing? To this innocence. And yet you don't hear in the lesson that Abraham barters or begs with God or negotiates or says, okay, why don't you try recalling me again, God? Because I don't think I heard you right the, the first time. I think there was a bad connection. He, he, he doesn't dawdle. And, and he doesn't just kind of, you know, kick ground and try and figure out how I can procrastinate and put this whole thing off. No, in fact, the lesson tells us early the next morning, Abraham got up loaded his donkey. He took with him two of his servants and his son Isaac. When he had cut enough wood for the burnt offering, he set out for the place that God had told him about. Now just think about that. Again, no procrastination before the sun even cracks over the horizon while it's still dark. After a restless night of no sleep, Abraham gets up and what does he do? He goes out behind the shed and he starts splitting wood. And not only that, but he's trying to figure out, again, just how much wood to cut. And he goes, okay, Isaac's yay big. Okay. I mean, I'm going to need about, yeah, I'm going to need about this much wood. And he's counting out all the, the logs and the wood just so completely. Is that what it's going to take? And he sets out. Now, he, we're told he goes then from where he's at in Beersheba to Moriah, which is about a three days journey, about 50 miles. It takes three days to get there. Oh, it's not like he could just go and rip the bandaid off and get this over with. He's got to take a three day journey and have all these thoughts circling in his head. Doubt plaguing his heart. Did I hear God right? Is this what I'm really supposed to do? How's God going to remedy this whole thing? Because here there's an apparent promise from God in one hand and a contradicting command in the other. How, how's God going to rectify and reconcile this situation? Am I going to be able to do this? Am I really going to be able to do this? To, to take the blade that I have on my hip? And am I going to be able to sacrifice my son? Am I going to be able to light that fire? Am I... Can you imagine? I mean, just the torment. Three days making your way with all of these, these doubts and, and fears and worries plaguing your heart and making you wonder and question everything about your life, everything about God. Every, every time I, I look at this section of Scripture, I always ask, why would God do that? Why would God give Abraham this test of faith? 
God was the one who blessed him with this. God was the one who gave him this gift. And why would he give it to him and then tell him that he was going to take it back? That he was going to rip it, I mean, rip it out of his heart. Why would God, why would God do that? I mean, God knew how much Abraham cared for his son. He acknowledged that. Take your son, your only son, whom you love. Interestingly to note, this is the first time the word love appears in the Bible. Genesis chapter 22, to describe a father's love for his son. Why would God do that? God is the one who blesses us all with the gifts that he gives. And, you know, every time God does that, every time he's generous to us and blesses us with gifts in our lives, he always runs the risk of us forgetting about the giver of those gifts and focusing so much on the gift itself. Was that maybe what God was asking Abraham to pause and consider? And maybe is that what we need to pause and consider Are there things in my life that my heart and my faith have so gravitated? Number one priority, the, the life's ambition in my life. And it, it could be good things, but things that I've kind of gotten out of whack when it comes to the priorities in my heart. Is it you know, so desperately seeking that relationship? I don't want to be single anymore. I want to be married, and I'm just looking for that marriage. And once I get that marriage, then I'll be happy? Could it be how my husband acts, how my spouse, how my wife acts, if, if they just acted in such a way and th then my marriage would work out? Or is it, is it kids? Kids are a tremendous blessing, the apple of our eye, but if it's like, oh, I won't be happy unless I have this many kids, or I won't be happy until I have a boy, or I won't be happy until we have girls, or I won't be happy until we have at least five, or whatever it might be. My career ambitions, or my retirement age, or relationships, my, oper my, my, my reputation with my friends and with my family. What, these are wonderful blessings that God gives us, but again, are we taking those things and loving them more, prioritizing them more than our God? Uh, our lesson continues that after those three days, they finally arrive at Moriah. On the third day, Abraham looked up and saw the place in the distance. He said to his servants, Stay here with the donkey while I and the boy go over there. We will worship, and then we will come back to you. Did you catch it? What did he say? We will come back. We will go worship, and we will come back. The writer to the Hebrews actually has some insight as to what Abraham is thinking in this moment. This is what's written in Hebrews this uh, chapter 11. It says, By faith, Abraham, when, tested, when God tested him, offered Isaac as a sacrifice. He who had received the promises was about to sacrifice his one and only son, even though God had said to him, quote, It is through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. Listen to this. Abraham reasoned that God could raise the dead... And figuratively speaking, he did receive Isaac back from death. He knew to himself, well, God made these promises, so if I sacrifice Isaac and I burn him to ash, which is what a burnt offering was, you completely destroyed whatever was being sacrificed. Abraham had confidence, had faith that, well, God will raise him back to life. Because after all, God has made his promise. And so they make their ascent. And, and as they did, oh, Isaac notices something. And can you imagine? He's like, I don't know, again, six or 16, but I always pictured him younger, like six, 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 seven, eight years old. Isaac notices this. Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering and placed it on his son Isaac. And he carried himself the fire and the knife. As the two of them went on together, Isaac spoke up and said, Father, yes, my son, Abraham replied. The fire and the wood are here, Isaac said. But where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Oh. Oh. 
I mean, with each step up that mountain, his heart must have sank lower and lower and lower. And then the innocence of that question. Abraham swallows and he says, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. And the two of them went on together. When they reached the place God had told him about, Abraham built an altar there and arranged the wood on it. He bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Then he reached out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord called out to him from heaven, Abraham, Abraham, here I am, he replied. Do not lay a hand on the boy, he said. Do not do anything to him. Now I know that you fear God because you have not withheld from me your son, your only son. Abraham looked up and there in the thicket he saw a ram caught by its horns. He went over and took the ram and sacrificed it as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called that place, the Lord will provide. And to this day it is said, on the mountain of the Lord it will be provided. What a sacrifice. But I'm not talking about Abraham and Isaac. I'm talking about God our Father in heaven and His Son, Jesus Christ. What a sacrifice. See, uh, there on that mountain where Abraham and Isaac were, the mountain that Abraham called, the Lord will provide. Centuries later stood a temple, Solomon's temple, where countless sacrifices Lambs and rams and goats and sheep and bulls were brought and blood was spilt to remind the people, God's people, over and over and over again that sin requires a payment, that sin requires a sacrifice. And year after year, century after century, that's what God's people did. There on that mountain, they slaughtered animals to remind themselves of the seriousness, the severity of their sin, but also the promise of God. The promise that an ultimate sacrificial lamb would come and just a stone's throw away on another mountaintop there from Moriah, a place called Mount Calvary or Golgotha. God, our Father in heaven, didn't hold back, didn't withhold his son, his only son whom he loved. Again, interesting little footnote. First time where it talks about love in the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke. At the baptism of Jesus where he says, this is my son, my only son. And in the Gospel of John, John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. We stand here and we marvel at that sacrifice of God in heaven. You know, what, what would you be willing to do for God or to give up for God? This is the wrong question. And, and yet, if you boil it down, every man-made religion and, and, and even most branches of Christian denominations kind of come back to that. What are you willing to sacrifice? What are you willing to do? What are you willing to give up? But that's not the story of the Bible. That's not how God works. It's not what are you willing to do. It's marvel and awe at the sacrifice your God has given for you. Stand there at Calvary with your jaw draped and your heart wide open and see the Son of God give up his life for you. See your Father in heaven who was willing to do that, to take a Father's love and sacrifice it on a cross so that you and I might be his own. He saw us in our sins. He saw us in our restlessness. He saw us in that hopeless state and there wasn't anything he wasn't willing to do in order to make us his own. This, this Lenten season, 
May we truly ponder that, that sacrifice that our Father in heaven made for us. No one can challenge a father's love. But here we see its greatest act in God our Heavenly Father. And we marvel with hearts and thankful praise what a sacrifice our God has made. With that, all God's people say, Amen. 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 May the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, guard your hearts and your minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. We continue our worship with uh, our offerings of thanks. Ushers are going to be coming through with offering baskets if you'd like to do that. Or also you can go to the church website and give online if you're so inclined to do that. Um, at some point, again, if you didn't scan the QR code, especially guests and visitors who are here with us today, uh, if you didn't scan the QR code on the welcome table, there is another one that's on page 8 in the worship folder. If you wouldn't mind just scanning that to mark your visit here with us today so we can follow up and thank you for spending time time. Again, we appreciate the fact that you took an hour out of your day to come here um, and, and be here with us, and we appreciate that so much, and we just want to thank you for that. Uh, with that, then, we bring our offerings of thanks to God. Dear members of peace, John and Melissa instructed in the teachings of the Word of God desire to become members of this congregation. John, Melissa, Jesus Christ confess before his Father in heaven those who faith to the these questions. Do you believe in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? If so, answer, I do. I do. do you believe the teaching of the Evangelical Lutheran Church as you have learned to know it is faithful and true to the Word of God? I do. I do. Do you intend to continue steadfast in the true Christian faith, be diligent in the use of God's Word and sacrament, and lead a godly life even to death? I do, and I ask God to help me. I do, and I ask God to help me. Will you start with your prayers, time, talents, and offerings, the work of our Lord that he's given to this congregation? If so, answer, I will, and I ask God to help me. I will, and I ask God to help me. Having heard your promises, we, the members of peace, in Evangelical Lutheran Church, receive you in fellowship and love. We invite you to share in our worship and mission in the name of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, author and perfecter of our faith, in mercy you joined John and Melissa to your church when they were born again of water and the Spirit. In mercy you taught them your saving truth. 
Grant that they may offer themselves as living sacrifices to you as their spiritual act of worship. Transform them by the renewing of their minds so that they will not conform to the pattern of this world. Help us live in love and harmony with one another and work together in serving you. Keep us united in your spirit and bring us at last to your eternal kingdom where you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Welcome. We have you with us. Thank you. Yeah. With that, then, we continue with the prayer of the church found on page 9. Heavenly Father, you loved the world and gave your Son to liberate us from sin and death by his obedient death on the cross. We confess that without your love, we are lost. Lord of the church, we thank you for the treasure of the gospel. By your Spirit, keep our eyes fixed on Jesus, the author and perfect. Faith. Strengthen our determination to do what pleases you, no matter what the danger or the cost. Let us pray for those who carry a cross in the name of Christ and face ridicule and persecution for the sake of the kingdom. Missionaries and chaplains, young people who stand up for what is right in the face of pressure to do what is wrong, and all who pay a high price for their faith and their values as Christians. By your Spirit, O Lord, grant them patience and endurance. Let us pray for those who carry heavy burdens in life, the sick and the chronically ill, the depressed and the lonely, those torn by conflict and personal relationships, those victimized by war and injustice, and all who face the terrors of life with a heavy heart. Grant them peace, O Lord, and in your mercy be their guardian and friend, their comfort and hope. Hear us, Lord, also as we bring you our private petitions in silent prayer. Help us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Keep us faithful even to the point of death that we may receive the crown of life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. We join in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. We continue our worship with the singing of our next hymn.
Closing prayer and blessing. Lord God, all holy desires, all good counsels, and all just works come from you. Give to us, your servants, that peace which the world cannot give, that our hearts may be set to obey your commandments. Defend us also from the fear of our enemies, that we may live in peace and quietness through the merits of Jesus Christ, our Savior who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make it you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. You may be seated for our closing hymn. If your children are sticking around for peace, kids, you can start to make your way in the back for peace, kids, and we'll continue then with our closing hymn. Lori's taking them in the back there.
Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to worship. Nice to see all of you here today. Again, warm welcome to our guests and our visitors. We're glad that you're here with us today. A uh, special uh, congratulations and welcome to, to John and Mel Crow. So nice to have you here as part of our church family. Um, as uh, I exit, I'm going to put you on the spot and I'm going to make you stand there in the back with me so that way people can introduce, shake your hands, introduce yourself to the newest members of our church, okay? Um, Thank you to uh, everybody who helped with setup here today. The only extra announcement that's not in the worship folder is that there are sign-up sheets on the high tables. Is that what you said, Ellen? On the black high tables in the back for the uh, the Easter brunch that we're going to be doing. Again, if you're newer to Peace and you weren't here for how we do Peace meals, um, it's pretty good. Um, yeah, we, we do we do some good things well, and, and meals is one of them. So um, be sure to look at the sign-up sheet, and, and if you can help out with that, that would be great. Oh, Ron? Game night Friday night. Game night this Friday night. Okay, I did not have that in the, the folder. So this Friday night at 6.30? 6.30. 6.30, okay? All right. I wish you God's richest blessings on your week. Uh, again, we'll see you next Sunday. If not before, please again, come back. You're always welcome. Have a great week. Thank you.